I also want to start by clarifying that tonight is uh, about the subject matter at the heart of the new assessment report released yesterday. Uh, that means we're talking much more about impact and adaptation and vulnerability than we are about mitigation uh, or cutting emissions. Now, obviously, we've had a lot more policy discussion about emissions uh, reduction and the controversy around that. Um, but one thing that this report does tell us, and it tells us loudly, is that it's not really a question of either or, of whether we mitigate or adapt, that we absolutely have to do both. And so the integration of the two will be at the heart of some of the discussion tonight. Now, responding to climate change by talking about emissions was difficult enough. Um, and now, of course, we have to talk about food security and hunger and about the potential decline of economic growth and about heat and health impacts, the possibility of increased conflict, environmental migrants, environmental disasters, and our ability to adapt to all of those. So the point of the evening is to lay out how the conversation has to expand beyond the sole focus on, on mitigation and on emissions to our experiences, to our expectations, to our responses to the change that's already happening. So the format for tonight is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're going to have four short presentations, around 15 minutes a piece, a piece uh, and then questions from you uh, and discussions about the report and what it might mean for Australia, for our everyday lives, uh, and for the kind of action that's necessary to prepare for climate change now and in the future. So let me start by introducing the panel. I'll do that now, and then we'll just have them uh, come up and speak one at a time, and I'll do this in order. So we'll start with Professor Leslie Hughes of Australia's Climate Council. She's a lead author for the current report, for the fourth and fifth assessment reports. She's an ecologist in the Department of Biological Sciences at Macquarie University and an expert on the impact of climate change on species and ecosystems. She brings unique insights to the panel discussion due to her close involvement uh, in the writing of the report, in particular on the Australia chapter, Australasia chapter. Next up will be Rosemary Lister. She's a professor of climate and environmental law here at the Sydney Law School. She's director of the Australian Centre for Climate and Environmental Law. Uh, Rosemary co-convenes the climate change group uh, in the Sydney Environment Institute, and she specializes in climate law and has three books uh, with Cambridge University Press in the area, and another forthcoming uh, next year specifically on climate justice and disaster law. Uh, so she brings some keen insights uh, to this evening. Uh, last year, Rosemary was appointed a Herbert Smith Freehills visiting professor at Cambridge Law School, uh, and this year she's been appointed a visiting fellow at Trinity College, Cambridge, uh, and a visiting professor uh, to the University of California at Berkeley. Next up will be Associate Professor Dale Dominey Howes uh, from the School of Geosciences here at the University of Sydney. He's a global leader in natural hazards and disaster reduction. His research focuses on enhancing community resilience, reducing losses from natural disasters, and developing appropriate disaster risk reduction strategies. And Dale will talk about the report's focus on adaptation and vulnerability. And then finally, John Connor, who is the CEO of the Climate Institute, which is an independent research organization that highlights the impacts of climate change, will wrap up. The Climate Institute has examined impacts and vulnerability in terms of community well-being and health, as well as the risks to interdependent infrastructure. It's called for a greater assessment of the risks of two and four degree warming scenarios. So we'll start with Professor Leslie Hughes. Thanks, Leslie. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, David and Rosemary, for inviting me along tonight. I'm glad to say that I wasn't in Yokohama for the final meeting, um, because I don't think I'd be standing here sentient if I was. My colleagues got very little sleep over the last five days. Before I start talking about the key findings, I just want to um, say a few things about the IPCC process. I did have some slides on this and saved them onto my desktop instead of my USB. So I'll try and remember what I was going to say about it. Um, the IPCC is really uh, quite an extraordinary organisation. I feel very privileged to have played um, a tiny little part in that. Uh, this last assessment report had over 300 convening and lead authors, plus several hundred more contributing authors from over 70 nationalities. The report went through four drafts and in total there was nearly 50,000 comments on the report. 
each of which was responded to in writing and all of the comments and all of the responses of the authors to the comments are available uh, or will be available on the IPCC website. So it's an extraordinarily transparent process. Uh, when I was um, at the first meeting of the IPCC fourth assessment report, I remember sitting at the first meeting, which was in Vienna in the United Nations building, and sitting in this little room with uh, one of my other IPCC virgins who was on that report for the first time, and uh, he's a coastal uh, ecologist called Nick Harvey, and, and Nick said to me, he said, you know, a whole chapter's only 25 pages, and there's, there's eight of us, so that means we only have to write about three and a bit pages each. How long can that possibly take? And I went, oh, I don't know, you know not too long. Well, the answer was four years. Um, and that was the same this time as well. This process for the fifth assessment report started in 2009, and uh, we are all extremely relieved uh, that it was released on time at 11 o'clock Sydney time yesterday. So let me tell you a little bit about um, the global key findings and then the Australasian and Australian key findings. And I'm using deliberately some of the same language that is used in the report. And the first really important statement, I think, is that humans are interfering with the climate system. Secondly, that the impacts of climate change are already apparent, they are widespread and consequential. Once again, these are IPCC words. Uh, this is one of the indicative figures in the uh, summary for policymakers. You don't need to get too hung up on all the little symbols, but basically they're used to show that there are all sorts of impacts already visible all over the world, land and sea, uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, what we have seen with this report is that the predictions of, say, a decade ago are now observations. There's been a lot of journalists over the last couple of days that have said to me, so what's new about this report? And it's kind of tempting to say, well, nothing really, because there isn't anything qualitatively new about it. Rather, we have more evidence, more science, more research, and therefore more confidence. So it really just reinforces the findings of the previous reports. Third key message is that without significant and effective adaptation, and that should say, and mitigation, we can expect significant future impacts on all sectors, water resources, infrastructure, coasts, biodiversity, health, and agriculture. Here's one of the figures from the SPM. This shows our uh, predicted reductions mostly in yield of uh, the major crops that feed most of the world. Soy is a little bit um, increased, uh, but wheat, rice and maize, which are the three major food crops of the world, are all projected to be reduced significantly in yield due to rising temperatures. And of course, this is at a time when we need more and more food to feed the growing population. Another key message is that strong mitigation can substantially reduce risks in the second half of the century, but that greenhouse gases already in the system will lock in climate change. In fact, Vincente Barros, who's one of the co-chairs of the Working Group 2, used a great phrase in the press release. He called it baked in. The change is already baked into the climate system because of the greenhouse gases already released. But what we're talking about now is that what we do in the next few years makes an enormous difference to the climate of the planet in the second half of this century and really makes a difference as to whether it's livable or not. Without very strong mitigation, the report makes the finding that very serious risks become increasingly likely. There is a growing risk of impacts that we simply cannot adapt to, even with the best adaptation. And we also risk crossing critical thresholds or tipping points in the climate system. And we don't know where these are, but it's generally considered that when we get to above two degrees, the probability of crossing them becomes significantly greater. Two of them that are highlighted in the report are the potential switch of the Amazon from being a net sequester of carbon to being a net 
source of carbon due to forest dieback and also the release of carbon and methane uh, via the melting of the permafrost. Um, this is one of the summary figures of the report. I realise it's probably a little bit small for the people up the back to see, um, but let me take you through it. Um, the graph on the left-hand side shows the temperature anomaly that we've had so far, and then two potential futures. Uh, the bottom one um, is known as RCP 2.6 for those aficionados of these sorts of things. It's a very, very strong mitigation scenario. Um, probably, well, most people regard it as almost impossible to achieve. Um, that gives us a warming of, on average, about one and a half degrees. If we get to one and a half degrees, we'll have a warmer planet than at any other time in the history of the human species. The kind of big red band um, is the RCP 8.5, which is actually to the trajectory we are at the moment on. That's the business as usual scenario. That gets us up to about four and a half degrees on average by the end of the century. Um, the various coloured bars here on the right hand side, and I realise that you, only the people in the front can actually see um, what this means, but they basically refer to the level of risk for different systems. The first bar is unique and threatened systems. Um, the darker the colour, the greater the risk at different temperatures. The second bar is extreme weather events. The third bar, the distribution of impacts, that is, will they be distributed regionally or more broadly across the globe? Uh, the fourth one is global aggregate impacts, and that's when you try to put all sorts of impacts together, including um, economic impacts. And then the last one is the tipping points, the large-scale singular events, the potential to cross over critical thresholds. Moving now on to chapter 25, and one of my lead authors, is uh, Sandra Schuster, is also here, so you can ask her any questions about insurance. Um, Australia's climate is changing is our first major finding, um, and that should say, sorry, uh, 0.09 degrees per decade since uh, the 20th century, uh, greatest warming over inland. Ocean temperatures are increasing, and in fact they're increasing so fast in the Southern Ocean uh, that it's become a global warming hotspot. We're getting more extreme hot days, far fewer cold extremes. Rainfall has decreased in the southeast and the southwest, but increased in the northwest. Sea levels are rising at, at or a little bit above global average, it's about three millimetres or a bit more per year, and snow is declining. Um, these are some projections for the future. The main ones to look at, the top ones are temperature, the bottom ones are rainfall. Um, it's probably better to look at the top set of um, maps rather than the bottom. The top set in each case are the RCP 8.5, that's the business as usual, um, and they show uh, us getting basically very, very hot indeed through the, the rest of this century. Rainfall is shown on the bottom set of maps and you can see how variable it is. Due to, you can see the different colours uh, across uh, the continent. Once again, uh, probably continue to increase rainfall up in the northwest, increase the drying trends in the south. Though rainfall projections are, have a lot more uncertainty attached to them than temperature projections, which does make uh, adaptation extremely challenging. Um, just to put that in perspective with the historical and projected temperature then specifically for Australia. It's a similar graph to I showed before for the global picture, um, but now once again that um, strong mitigation scenario, the blue band, uh, the business as usual scenario for Australia, that red band, giving us about on average four degrees by the end of the century. So Australia's climate will continue to change through the 21st century, um, as I said before, up to about five degrees, possibly on land, uh, a couple more degrees in the ocean. Uh, basically everything that's been happening is set to just keep going uh, and potentially increase in rate, uh, including increases in bushfire danger, uh, potentially a reduction in the number of tropical cyclones, but the ones we do get are likely to be of increased intensity and therefore increased in damage potential. We could have a snow-free, in fact, we're quite likely to have a snow-free alpine zone by the end of the century. 
Another point that the chapter makes is that despite being um, a highly developed country, um, recent uh, responses and impacts of extreme events highlight Australia's vulnerability to increases in extreme events. Uh, we use examples for, uh, of the Queensland floods in 2011, 35 lives lost, nearly $6 billion in public infrastructure damage, the 2009 heatwave in Victoria, um, over 300 excess deaths due to that heatwave, uh, nearly 200 people died in the bushfires that uh, came next. 2,000 houses lost and considerable damage. The chapter identified eight key risks and we bundled them up into three groups depending on the combination of adaptation and mitigation that's needed uh, to reduce those risks. So the first two are really the, the most serious ones at this point. Changes in the structure and composition of coral reefs, the Great Barrier Reef and the Ningaloo off Western Australia and loss of montane systems and uh, extinctions of native species. These we considered to be risks that could be delayed, but to some extent are unavoidable. They are locked in in the warming trajectory that we will get, uh, and they cannot be completely avoided. In fact, um, there's some quite strong language in the report that at two degrees, it is likely we will lose coral reefs as we know them today. The second set of risks, there are four that we considered uh, had the potential to be severe, but that could be reduced with strong mitigation and effective adaptation. And these are increased damage due to flooding, uh, due to intensity, uh, increased intensity of rainfall events, reduced water resources in the southern parts of the continent, increased mortality, morbidity and infrastructure damage due to heat waves, and increased damage and loss of life from bushfires. And then the last two risks we considered to be um, of somewhat more uncertain in nature because their severity will depend on whether the more severe end of the projections are realised. And there's two of these. One is damage to coastal infrastructure and low-lying ecosystems if the high end of sea level projections, that is the metre plus, are realised. Uh, and also reduced agricultural production in the southeast, southwest, and the Murray Darling if the high end drying scenarios are realised. And then my final slide about adaptation, and some of the other speakers will be expanding on this topic. We found uh, the IPCC report this time, one of, the, one of the new things about it is that there was a much bigger focus on adaptation than there was in the fourth assessment simply because there is actually more to talk about now. There's a lot more focus on adaptation research-wise and also in policy. So there are three chapters on adaptation in the um, whole report that didn't exist in the fourth assessment. So our chapter likewise had quite a significant <coughs> focus on adaptation. Uh, we found that there's been a significant increase in adaptation efforts since the last assessment. Uh, but this is hampered by a lot of different things, amongst them lack of integration between different levels of government and, and a highly variable understanding in climate change risks. Some adaptation options with uh, co-benefits for energy and water use have been implemented, which is good. Um, but planning for reduced water availability and for increased sea level rise in particular has been very piecemeal and in the case of sea level rise extremely contested but I'm sure uh, Rosemary who will be coming after me will be able to expand on that even further. Thank you very much. I would first of all as the director of the Australian Centre for Climate and Environmental Law welcome you all here tonight and thank you for your attendance and also to follow David in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. So, as David suggested, tonight we're not going to be talking too much about mitigation, rather about impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. And my uh, question, of course, is what is the role of law? And I'm going to begin by having a look at international law, because following the findings of the IPCC, the negotiations under the United Nations Framework Convention have changed remarkably, particularly since 2010. So on mitigation, just to remind you all, or if you don't know this, that we have already entered the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol, 
but unfortunately with very limited participation by developed countries so that it only covers about 13% of global emissions. And so essentially the most important mitigation decision is that no later than 2015, and this is the exact wording, a protocol or other legal instrument or an agreed outcome with legal force under the UNFCCC must be developed, so that's next year, and must come into effect from 2020, and it must also include all developed and developing countries as well. So as the IPCC has confirmed in its report yesterday, very significant emissions reductions are needed. The first point that I want to talk about is adaptation. And as you can see there, I've called this an emerging crisis for, reason, for reasons that I will elucidate in a moment. But in 2010, as David was saying, the negotiations didn't really focus much on adaptation. But in 2010, the Cancun Adaptation Framework was adopted by the Conference of Parties. And what it requires is that all countries developed and developing must undertake impact, vulnerability and adaptation assessments. All countries must enhance climate change disaster risk reduction and cooperate on climate change displaced persons, especially with regard to their migration and planned relocation at the national, the regional and also at the international level. And I think you can see that this is an attempt by the Conference of the Parties to put all countries on notice about the scientific findings and the likely outcomes. Least developed countries, those are the poorest of uh, developing countries, are encouraged to adapt by developing these national adaptation plans for which they're going to get funding. Now obviously funding to developing countries is absolutely crucial so on funding, we've got two mechanisms under the UNFCCC. The first is the Adaptation Fund, which was developed uh, in 2001. And funds are paid into this particular fund by 2% of the proceeds generated from the sale of various Kyoto Protocol compliant international carbon credits. So it's too complicated for me to go through all of those, but there are certain credits that can be generated and which are sold internationally. So 2% of those sales go into the fund. And secondly, in order to raise more funding from developed countries under the 2009 Copenhagen commitments, developed countries agreed to $30 billion in fast start funding. So that's for the years 2010 to 2012. And then $100 billion per year uh, by 2020. And this is to address the mitigation and the adaptation needs of developing countries. And note that at Warsaw in December 2013, for the very first time, it was agreed that these funds must be split between mitigation options and adaptation activities. Well, also at Warsaw, the parties expressed in separate documentation their very serious concerns about the sustainability, the adequacy, and the predictability of funding for the adaptation fund. Why did they do that? Well, essentially, it's because of the way in which the carbon credit markets collapsed in 2012. And so if you see there, I've just mentioned three of the different types of Kyoto uh, carbon credits. The prices in the first one going from 9.7 euros on average in 2011 to 17 cents in 2012, 4 euros at the start of 2012 to only 0.5 euros by December 2012, and 3.86 in January of 2012 to 0.34 in December of 2012. So what the Conference of the Parties is saying is where are we going to get the money from for adaptation. So what they've done as a result of this impending crisis with funding for adaptation, they've decided to convene a biennial uh, high-level ministerial meeting on climate finance which starts this year and will continue up to 2020. In addition, 
for the first time, the Conference of the Parties decided to establish a separate mechanism on loss and damage. It's called the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage Associated with Climate Change Impacts, and it's established under the Adaptation Framework, which I've just mentioned. Now, what it does is that it places obligations on developing countries that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change, which is most developing countries, to undertake risk management strategies to address the loss and damage associated with climate change, including the extreme events, but also the slow onset events such as drought and obviously concerns about food security. But what the Conference of the Parties <coughs> acknowledges and tells all of us is that these losses cannot all be reduced by adaptation. And that's exactly what Leslie was saying as well. So the funding concerns about the loss and damage mechanism apply in the same way that their concerns about funding for adaptation applies. Now I just wanted to give you some recent statistics of figures that insurers have put out with regard to uh, loss and damage from extreme weather events. You may be aware of these events, but just putting some numbers to them, $53 billion for China and $6 billion for Pakistan because of the extraordinary rainfall events that they experienced in 2010. $30 billion in total damages from the 2011 Thailand floods, $50 billion in preliminary damage <coughs> assessments from Hurricane Katrina in the US, and even before we experienced the 2013 floods, Munich Re reported that financial losses from extreme weather events in Australia have risen fourfold in the past 30 years. So I've put those figures up just to give you a sense of what insurers are saying about the types of losses that are being suffered as a result of extreme weather events. So what in my view are some of the emerging international law issues. Well, I'm sure that you can imagine from what I've already said that where governments and insurers capacity to respond to adaptation needs, but also these climate disasters are exhausted. And all the literature shows how quickly these resources are exhausted. Who should compensate the victims? because of course the damage and the loss is significant. Opportunities to rely on tort law, those of you who are lawyers, to claim damages are very limited. And through my research in the past year, what I have proposed is the establishment of a fossil fuel funded climate disaster response fund under the Warsaw Loss and Damage Mechanism. Why do I do this? It's based on very thorough and detailed research of legal precedents which already exist in similar type of situations. So proposing that a levy be placed on the top 200 coal and oil and gas companies which have been already identified in the unburnable carbon report that John is going to be speaking to uh, in a moment. So what precedents have I looked at at international law the mechanism set up to look at global oil pollution spills, hazardous chemical regimes in the US, asbestos in Australia, and nuclear disasters in Japan. So this research is very detailed into all of those regimes. It compares and distinguishes the loss and damage mechanism from those and sets up the design of the fund also based on international law mechanisms. What about climate displaced persons? Well, the question here is which international law instruments should apply? And there is a lot of discussion about this in the research. First of all, should the Geneva Convention apply? This is the convention which applies to refugees if people cross borders as a result of the stress which they are facing from climate change. And if they are to be acknowledged, should they be acknowledged whether they are forced by their governments to flee or whether they voluntarily 
across borders. Now, the empirical evidence done very recently, in fact last year, tends to suggest that people stay within their own countries, if at all possible. So where people are migrating within their own countries, then surely international human rights law should apply to those people to protect their political, their social and their economic rights. For example, to housing, to food, to shelter, to education and so on. But it should also apply to those who cross international borders. And then what about the UNFCCC? Could we utilise and invoke the UNFCCC to protect <coughs> climate displaced persons? My research suggests that we could because the, the convention is already mentioning the fact that governments need to protect and think about, remember, the planned relocation of climate displaced persons. And then the, the last point, what about humanitarian assistance? How do we extend humanitarian assistance to this new category of vulnerable people? What is the role of domestic law? Well, domestic law, of course, places very significant responsibilities on all levels of government. In Australia, on the federal government, on state governments and also on local governments to understand the vulnerability of communities and to deliberately, to deliberately acknowledge the risks and to develop law and policy responses to the risks which now have been identified in the report. That's adaptation and the various stages of a disaster are all part of the risk management strategy to which the law must respond. And we've had enough experience of this in Australia to be thinking about the various stages. First of all, trying to mitigate the risk of the disaster. So land use and planning mechanisms, building codes, any number of responses. Emergency responses, this is actually a legal question. Who is in charge? when disaster strikes. And we've seen, for example, with the Victorian bushfires and even in the Queensland floods, that there's some dispute as to who really is on duty, which level of government during the disaster. And then looking at the question which I raised about insurance and compensation. You may know that after the Queensland flood, the Commonwealth Government changed the Insurance Act to cover the types of scenarios where insurers were saying that they weren't liable to compensate victims of those floods. And then finally, what usually happens is that governments step in ex post facto and they compensate victims to the extent of their resources. Of course, in developing countries, this is extremely difficult. And also, they rebuild and they support the rebuilding of individual homes and so on, but also the rebuilding of infrastructure. So what legal mechanisms should be used for that? Well, we all know that after the Queensland flood, we were hit with a levy, the Queensland flood levy, because that was an acknowledgement by government that perhaps they were short of funds in terms of giving a full response to the disaster that was caused. Who decides who should benefit so if the government does set up a compensation fund, who is the person or the institution that sets out the criteria for who is entitled to benefit? And also, how should people make the claims that they are entitled to make under the law? So the, this is a range, it's not all of them, but it's a range of issues that the law needs to respond to with regard to adaptation and also with regard to disasters. And it implicates almost every branch of the law, constitutional law, administrative law, torts, insurance, environmental law, and so on. So in conclusion, that was a snapshot of international law mechanisms as well as domestic mechanisms. I think that compelling, compelling scientific evidence makes it clear that law has and will continue to have a fundamental role to play in recognizing and protecting the rights of human and non-human populations 
facing increasingly serious risks to their survival and in allocating the risks and responsibilities of all parties, governments, business, civil society and individuals in both mitigating uh, and also adapting to the impacts and the risks of climate change. Thank you very much. The atmosphere we see uh, bushfires and droughts, uh, storms and floods. As is immediately clear, these two systems interrelate. They feed back between one another. And for the purposes of adaption to and managing disaster risks, these are the sphere, spheres of the Earth system that we're most interested in. The United Nations has been cataloguing and keeping information about disasters the world over and by region over the last 100 years or so. And there's a very clear trend. The number of global disasters is rising. The number of people being killed by natural disasters, fortunately, is either levelling off or declining, quite clearly. But the number of people affected around the world has increased substantially through the 20th century, and the forecasts for the future are increasing disaster impacts. And then the economic losses associated with disasters, as we've heard already, are increasing all the time. About 80% of global disaster declarations are what we refer to as hydrometeorological. They're related to extreme weather and climate events. And those little pie charts in the different geographic regions of the world in the upper part of that figure, basically stuff in blue is where most disasters are occurring. And these broad statistics that you can see on your left show disaster declarations over the last 30 years. So very clearly, hydrometeorological weather and climate disasters are the big ones that affect us, both traditionally in the past and forecasts for the future associated with disaster management. Um, in New South Wales, just to benchmark, about 90% of all of the disasters declared in the last 10-year period were related to weather and uh, climate. Um, this graph very gently shows economic losses, uh, population affected, and number of people killed by natural disasters globally uh, over a 12-year period from the start of the 21st century. There are some very big numbers there. And as I say, climate change, uh, given the fact it has the potential and capacity to drive changes in extreme weather and climate-related events, ensures that we are committed to a future trajectory of an increasing set of losses. Um, you might reasonably ask the question, how does that relate to the situation in Australia? Well, this graph shows disasters over a 30-year period, and that shows that, again, storms and floods are the most commonly occurring disasters in our geographic region. In terms of what are the big killers taking human lives, well, in actual fact, extreme temperature and heat waves are the type of events that in fact take most human lives in Australia. And preliminary data from the heat waves in early 2014 affecting South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales suggests that mortality may have reached um, potentially 2,000 individuals. So 2,000 people died as a consequence of the heat wave earlier this year. So heat waves are the big killers in Australia. And then in terms of economic losses, interestingly, drought is the type of disaster event, weather and climate, that has caused the greatest economic losses. It was interesting to hear Rosemary talk about some of the economic statistics. In terms of Australia's national accounting, we actually do not have a robust estimate of the cost economically of natural disasters that have affected the country in the last 20 or 30 years. But recent estimates are anywhere between 20 and $50 billion of economic losses, primarily from weather and climate related events. But what happens is when disasters strike, they affect our coupled human environment systems. They have effects on people, 
the built environment, our critical infrastructure, our agricultural systems. They impact on ecosystems and the natural world in which in so many ways we're dependent on the services provided by ecosystems. So disasters have the effects, uh, capacity to affect both the natural world and people at scales from the local to the national. So if we think about the Brisbane floods that were referred to just now, they affected geographically a broadly limited part of the country, yet there was a national impact in terms of the introduction of financial levies. So there were local effects that transcended to a national community. Now importantly, from a disaster planning and management perspective, our emergency services and governments are well equipped and well experienced with the process of disaster preparation and management. And we use a set of language and terms that enable us as planners and managers to support communities to prepare in advance and then respond when things go wrong. And the words that you'll see here are significant because the latest report, the IPCC, that was released yesterday has taken a much more risk-focused approach on the problem. That means we're beginning to align much more satisfactorily the problem of disaster management with the challenge of climate change and adaptation. That means we've already done a great deal of the legwork and groundwork in terms of preparation. And that's really important because whilst no one would deny the challenge at hand is not great, we do have the capacity to rise to that challenge. And I'm going to illustrate some of these elements as we go forward. So what is it that risk managers and disaster managers do? The risk management process of preparation goes through a few fundamental steps. Firstly, and fundamentally, we have to recognise that there is a problem. Now, forgive me, I will be, pardon the pun, I've used this joke before, to be slightly controversial, I believe that climate change is real. We have to accept and acknowledge that we have that problem. Until we do, there is a significant barrier to responding as a community to the challenge that climate change presents. But once we acknowledge that problem, those tasked with the responsibility set about assessing the hazard. What is the probability that certain types of extreme climate events like bushfires will occur at some point in the future? For particular geographic places on the ground, what is actually exposed to future bushfires of a certain intensity or magnitude? Uh, how many people, how many homes, what ecosystems are in the way and potentially at risk from the damaging fire? But once we've got some sort of assessment of exposure, we need to move to a more sophisticated assessment of vulnerability. Just because people and buildings and assets are on the ground in a place where an extreme event may occur, doesn't mean that all that infrastructure and people are uniformly vulnerable. Once we've got some assessment of the vulnerability, we begin to be able to forecast likely probable maximum loss for events of particular types of magnitude in the future. Once we've got some assessment of that PML, probable maximum loss, we can set about implementing risk management strategies in order to safeguard communities in the future. And ideally, all of that process occurs before the onset of the next disaster event. Once such an event has occurred, we retrospectively start to undertake a forensic analysis. What worked went well, do we understand why losses were well managed? If things went poorly and badly, do we understand why? And we feed this entire process back into the emergency risk management process. Disaster managers use something called a disaster cycle. We prevent pre where possible, prepare where necessary, respond and recover when disasters strike. And in terms of aligning more closely disaster risk management with climate change adaptation, once again, you can immediately recognise the language and the approaches start to align neatly. 
Bushfires, storms, floods and droughts are merely examples of the sorts of threats to our lives and our communities that Australia has lived with for tens of thousands of years. So it's well within our capacity to prepare, respond and recover when disasters strike. In terms of that who does what and when, um, three levels of governance operates in Australia to protect us in disaster situations. There are federal level legislation, policies and plans. There are state level policies and plans and committees and agencies. And at the local area, local emergency management officers employed within local government areas in partnership with state emergency service, rural fire service and the other emergency service organisations prepare for, plan and assist us to respond and recover when things go wrong. So ultimately, it brings us down to the what can we do? Well, adaptation and disaster management ultimately is a cooperative partnership between us as communities, the emergency services that respond and governments that fund that activity. It is not, in my view, acceptable to pass the responsibility exclusively to government. We have a cooperative role from the individual and family level scaled all the way up to society. So adaptation can be as simple as switching off the light when you leave the room at home. Do you really need to drive to the local shop to buy a pint of milk? You don't. Adaptation is very simple, but it scales all the way up to the polity. Disaster management is similar in that it is a cooperative partnership that starts with us as individuals and families and once again is scaled up to communities and governments working for us. I want to conclude and summarise by challenging us uh, to think about some future conversations that we as communities need to have. Given that we continue to build on floodplains, river floodplains, and in coastal landscapes that will be subjected to sea level rise, or in mountainous forested areas where bushfires do occur, what level of risk do we as communities tolerate now and in the future? Leslie referred to ecosystem thresholds and tipping points. The same applies in social and economic and policy contexts. At what critical points will we need to change direction and begin to evaluate and plan in a different way? When things go wrong, who's going to pick up the bill? And lastly, for those that are charged with the responsibility of managing and preparing and responding to disasters, the emergency services, do they have the qualifications, experiences and resources necessary in order to do their jobs effectively? In Australia, we essentially have a volunteer emergency service uh, community who do an outstanding job. But a question for us, is it enough? Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, just briefly about the Climate Institute. We're an independent research organisation around since 2005. Uh, we've been steady building, steadily building our work in the adaptation area. As uh, David said earlier, it's, it's been an extra strand that's had to develop uh, as we look to manage uh, the unavoidable while we try to avoid the unmanageable. Uh, we've been doing a lot more recently on climate disclosure, but all the way along we've also quietly been working uh, on following the money to the big long-term asset owners, and I want to come to some of that at the end. Uh, as Leslie said, uh, it's pretty clear some of the findings uh, in this report uh, that we, uh, the, our exposure across these sectors has been um, uh, revealed by the extreme events uh, that have been happening over the last while, and that these uh, are across a whole range of sectors uh, now, um, 
uh, Leslie talked about how it's been developing this literature over time as well, and it has been important and, and in some ways exciting to see the development in a, in, uh, a realisation that we need to adapt to these impacts. And that's been happening across a range of forums. Uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project, which is a, where uh, uh, companies are uh, uh, asked to disclose how they're dealing with uh, climate risks, has said that this is becoming a more increasingly a boardroom a level conversation. We've had some of the big reinsurance companies talk about that. KPMG talk about this as a mega force. Uh, and uh, as we've uh, talked about the, the um, IPCC report, um, to, uh, yesterday he's talked about this as well. What's very important and is often uh, left out is this issue of interdependency. And the, as the, uh, this World Bank report talked about, the cascading consequences, uh, that we shouldn't look at this just from an organisational or sectoral level. Uh, and um, the World Bank and others have been turning up the heat uh, on this as an issue. We put out a report, um, coming ready or not, uh, in 2012, um, uh, literally uh, as Sandy loomed off the New Jersey coast. Um, uh, we launched this report with Mervac and Westpac, um, where we had a look at a whole range of sectors and had a look at how they interacted with each other, uh, with some key findings that the policy is fragmented uh, at best, business response is uneven, uh, that um, that adaptation, uh, if, if it has been there, is actually very much at an organisational level, very much actually looking uh, backwards at past climate trends rather than looking forwards. So we're walking backwards into the 21st century. And um, against swimming against the, the tide of some of those other trends, we've actually seen some downturns. And we've looked at the CSIRO has done some attitudinal testing. Uh, amongst some of the companies that's actually been going uh, backwards in some of the concern. Now, that's partly because of the toxic uh, battle we've had around the carbon laws, uh, but also a, a psychological and cultural problem amongst any about how we deal with this um, a, as a very difficult issue. But it, as uh, some of the speakers have said, it's actually... Uh, it needs to be seen as a risk management issue. It's actually about accessing, assessing exposure to the risks and then looking at some of the... and building scenarios into what we can uh, expect uh, to, to build up uh, our resilience. Um, I probably can't see all that in detail. Well, this is just an example where the, the kinds of sectors that we looked at uh, and water, property, electricity, road and rail and financial services... Uh, and only water amongst those uh, were relatively advanced in, in their preparation, and particularly in water supply, uh, somewhat less than indeed um, uh, in some of the sewage management, uh, and that's partly and, and stormwater management as well. Uh, so um, that's um, but that is uh, one of the positive areas. Property, we are seeing some good examples of companies and others looking at the the, the broader risks but um, it's very much at a company level, uh, beginning to map those out. Energy and transport uh, systems haven't done uh, enough work and there's, been, there's regulatory uh, barriers uh, there to how they might actually uh, deal with that. Uh, with road and rail, one of the most vivid images that I always think about is this image of a guy who's walking in front of uh, a train in the, during the Melbourne heat waves literally with a hose. He was hosing down the railroad uh, to cool the rail down so the train could actually come uh, after him, which is uh, certainly not a very good way to uh, get around. Uh, um, in the financial services sector, I'll come back to in a moment, but uh, it's important that, you know, this, this sort of finding is not isolated. Uh, a range of uh, um, other analysis about the patchiness of our preparation uh, is out there from uh, living with floods through to the defence um, uh, sector and again here's where Australia has lagged others. We've actually started to see some past um, uh, Defence Force personnel, indeed um, Admiral Chris Barry spoke at a recent Climate Council uh, report and indeed even some of the um, existing Defence Force are beginning to get some work going on this now uh, and um, it's certainly the case uh, among security personnel uh, internationally and in particular um, you may not be surprised it's the Navy personnel who are the most active in speaking about that. But it's uh, patchy. Uh, 
One of the things I did want to focus on is actually about the finance uh, sector and um, superannuation sector. As I said, we've been doing a fair bit of work on this. This, uh, again, I won't uh, expect you to understand all of this, but it, uh, these are various scenarios uh, about the cost across a range of asset classes um, uh, and the impacts of um, uh, the level of action that we uh, take and the costs that we have. And it's important to understand amongst these sectors that they are what they call universal owners. Superannuation funds are investing across the broad range of asset classes. And so the old days of uh, socialising, uh, privatising the gains and socialising the losses, the days uh, of the Reinhardts and the Rockefellers, uh, are fading away, in fact, and so that you can't avoid that. And so this is a very important uh, concept and responsibility. Uh, and so um, charts like this from Merso, which is an asset consultant, are an important uh, element of some changes going on in the investment community. We've done uh, uh, a lot of work on this and we've just um, recently released a report, Climate Smart Super, from which a couple of these slides come. Again, you may not see all of them. But it is important to understand that climate change is the most high risk but high certainty now, as you look at the reports like the IPCC event that will ever impact global investment. Globally, around $30 trillion is in superannuation funds. If you add on the sovereign wealth funds and foundations and endowments, that's around $70 trillion worldwide. Uh, in 1995, that represented about 15% of global equity markets. Now it's over 50%. So these are the guys making the big decisions, but these are the guys, most importantly, who have a long-term responsibility for managing the money, often your money, uh, my money, as super funds. Uh, and so they need to be thinking long-term, not just in the shorter term of fund managers and others. Um, because it's our nest eggs, that was our nest egg being broken up there, um, if we don't treat that seriously. Uh, and so this actually sets up a very interesting and quite exciting uh, dynamic, uh, particularly with the superannuation funds, because there's an actual fiduciary duty, a direct duty between you and the superannuation trustees about how they manage the money. And we are seeing within the exercise of those duties, but also this broader debate, what some have described as, as a civil economy, a concept of, of a civil economy merging, like the civil society, where there are whole sets of rules, governance, and, and other principles which, uh, uh, which apply as we look at this chain that's there, which, re, which is uh, from citizen investors through their funds uh, into actual companies. Um, now, this is important because uh, if we're serious about um, our climate change, uh, and if we think about climate change, about the, the basic problems here, and as um, Rosemary was uh, talking about the unburnable carbon report and reports from Carbon Tracker and others, that if we do get serious about avoiding the worst of these impacts, of avoiding two degrees, some 80% or so of the fossil fuel reserves need to stay in the ground. Now, the problem is, when we've looked at, and others have looked at, uh, the, the funds and their components, around 55% of those Funds are in high carbon assets or carbon exposed assets and less than 2% are in the solutions. And so uh, while there are vigorous, so the, the job is to tilt that uh, somewhat and change those things and to actually hedge the, uh, the risks with greater low carbon investments. Um, others work on divestment. Our focus has been about trying to increase the investments in low carbon um, solutions. So what we've done, uh, and uh, I'm on the board of, and it's, it's a partner organisation we've set up, is the Asset Owners Disclosure Project, where we actually map uh, how these funds are managing your money. The risk management aspect is one of five key areas in which we're asking funds uh, to disclose, uh, as well as their investments in low carbon solutions, in their transparency, their active ownership uh, within uh, with, with the companies that they own. And so this is a report we released at the end of last year. There are a number of funds which are leading the way, uh, numbers who are dragging behind. Uh, from a university perspective, UniSuper is not amongst the best. It's, uh, I think, went from trip, uh, double A to triple B rating uh, and down to 30th worldwide. Um, but uh, that's one way in which we're trying to have a conversation uh, it's been a pretty robust conversation at the top uh, with funds and, uh, about matters including their uh, risk management. Um, there's a bottom-up 
a process where people as funds can exercise those, as fund members can exercise those ro rights. Uh, as, and we have this website, Are You The Vital Few, which enables you to have a conversation with the funds, take up with them about how they're managing some of these risks um, and uh, get active within that. Um, let's conclude in a couple of things. One of the elements we've just done recently is um, a global uni index. So um, the bigger uh, slabs of money, in particular here in Australia, are in, within the superannuation funds, but unis have endowments and foundations. And we just recently wrote uh, to the unis around the world about their, um, uh, their management of these risks. Uh, we got a, one of those oopsie moments where, uh, unfortunately, someone hit reply to our email. Uh, well, actually, David Pitt from, from Monash. Uh, you may have seen there was a late line show on this on Thursday, last Thursday night, uh, basically saying we're going to keep these guys in the dark. Uh, talked about how they talked about this with other G8 uh, um, of the universities. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and so all of that has uh, now been put on the public realm. And um, a lesson for a memo for ourselves, it was done on an iPad, which didn't even have the legal disclaimer. So um, uh, anyway, but uh, one of the points, and we've seen Glyn Davis from Melbourne Uni do a very long letter in response and an opinion piece uh, uh, in response to this. And his line was that people have given us money to manage. Uh, we'll try, we need to manage that um, and to get the best money out. If they want us to eth in, invest this ethically, they'll tell us. Our point is that this is not about ethical investment and it's not about fobbing off these things as Unisuper have done, just announced about it uh, in their socially respons responsible investment fund um, that we'll, 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 we'll work nicely here on the margins. It's actually about the, the basics of good financial management and long-term risk involvement. So... Um, that's, uh, sorry, that's from uh, John Hewson. That's actually in an opinion piece in Tomorrow's Australian in the higher education sector. So I'll just uh, close with a couple of things. With, um, where's um, Sydney Uni and how it's managing the risks? That's certainly um, a, a question. But um, I thought this really uh, jumped out at me as a, as a message for us for, for taking action uh, from the report. Um, we have done this in the past uh, to varying degrees of success. Let's hope we do that to the high, high degree of success as we manage these risks and uh, go forward. Thank you. I'd just like to hear from the panel, just each person, one specific action item uh, that folks might take away from the evening. Um, uh, log on to Are You The Vital Few and contact your super fund. Switch off the lights at home that you don't need. Well, I've been talking about the urgent need for law and policy development on the area of adaptation, and I think that it's only appropriate for me to suggest that you might like to contact the federal government and the state government and perhaps your local council and tell them that you're taking this issue very seriously and you would like to see action going forward rather than going backwards. I, I, that was going to be mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll just say respect good science. <laughs>